Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think it's uh, time to start. Uh, first of all, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, online uh, seminar. So this is the very first uh, seminar that we are uh, programming online in the usual uh, series of seminars of, of the IPC. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, the IPC, Tono State International Physics Center, so we have uh, we are a research center on physics and, and uh, related uh, disciplines. And we usually have uh, one, two seminars uh, per week, specialized uh, seminars. So uh, due to the current uh, situation, we had uh, somehow stopped the, uh, the program of seminars, but uh, now we are uh, starting again with this new uh, format. And we are uh, lucky enough uh, to have as the very first speaker uh, to Bo Chen. So actually the seminar of Bo Chen was already programmed uh, uh, at the end of uh, March, if I remember correctly. We couldn't make it, but now we have the opportunity to, to, to do it. And I really uh, thank him uh, very much for, for, for accepting to be the very first in this uh, series. So Bo Chen, he's an Iker Basque uh, Research uh, Fellow uh, at the IPC. He arrived uh, recently, so this is a very good opportunity to, to know uh, better his uh, uh, research interest and, and, and uh, recent uh, trajectory. So he obtained his PhD uh, in Shanghai, in the Institute of Technology of Shanghai. Uh, after that, he spent uh, several years in, in different institutions. So he was, as far as I remember, uh, in Penn State, in Cornell University, in Texas, in the University of uh, North uh, Texas. And as I said before, so now we, we are lucky enough uh, to have him uh, at the IPC. So uh, I leave uh, the word to, to Bo. Let me just please uh, remind you that uh, there will be two different ways of uh, making questions. So if you prefer to write your question, uh, you can do that at any moment during the seminar. You can write that in the uh, question and answers uh, section. You, you, you will find the icon in the uh, lower part of, of your screen. Anyway, these written questions will be read at the very end of the talk. Uh, another way to make your questions is to wait until the end of the talk, and then you can also use the icon of raise your hand, and then we will uh, uh, open the microphone for you to, to make yourself the, the question. So I hope that uh, this is clear. I hope that uh, uh, everything works fine and Bo, so you are very welcome and thank you very much again for accepting uh, to deliver this uh, seminar. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I guess so, okay. So um, um, first of all, thank you for the introduction and I'm very happy to be the first speaker of the DIPC seminars in this new online format. I hope everyone is doing well during this difficult time and I'm happy to see the country recovering from the pandemic and also the IPC resuming activity. So today I'm going to talk about nano threads and since nano threads is a relatively new topic, I think it might be helpful to spend a little bit more time on the introduction just to cover the basics. What are nano threads? Why are they interesting and how are they made? Then I'm gonna move on to my own research focusing on the structures and the reaction pathway or mechanism of nano thread. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how may nano thread fit into your research. So after this talk, if you find yourself interested in doing some nano thread related research, you might find the ideas I give in this section uh, useful. So let's get started. The first very important question, what are nano threads? A simple definition is that um, nano threads are 1D sp3 carbon-based nanomaterials. To put this definition into context, we can uh, look at this dimensionality and uh, hybridization chart. And let's first throw in some of the well-known examples carbon uh, fluorine nanotubes, graphene, graphite. They are sp2 carbons from 0D to 3D. And diamond is sp3 carbon in 3D. 
the next two members might not be uh, maybe less well known or less studied. Diamondoids are molecules. You can think of them as cutting a piece from diamond and saturated from outside with hydrogens. This particular one shown here is called adamantane. So it, it's the smallest piece you can cut from diamond, smallest cage molecule you can cut out from diamond. And usually these molecules are well characterized. Uh, graphene, you can think of it as a hydrogenated graphene. And there are reports claiming the synthesis of graphene. But in general, I found this material uh, is not very well characterized. So now we have a blank here, one DSP3, that's where nanothreads fit in. In this particular nanothread structure, you can think of it as a hydrogenated nanotube. That's a body view for this particular structure. And um, so I hope, so right now you have a uh, basic understanding of what nanothread is, and you may wonder, um, are there any other possible structures for nanothreads? Is the structure definitive? The answer to that question is no. Uh, nanothreads can have many different structures. And here I'm just showing you one. And I think I showed you two on, in, uh, on previous slides on the right side of the screen. And I'm yet gonna show you another one here. If you look at the local bonding, you'll find each carbon is bonded to three other carbons and a hydrogen, so it's sp3 carbon. And this thread does look somewhat different than uh, the three ones I've showed you before. And in that, this one is kind of, a, there's a kink here, there's curve there, and this feature, it turns out to be very important to an thread. And this feature happens because of the sp3 um, bonding in the backbone. So um, now that we have a basic understanding of uh, uh, what a nanothread is, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think nanothreads are interesting. The first thing um, I think nanothreads are interesting is because of its structure variety. So I, as an organic chemist, always find myself fascinated about uh, structures of organic molecules. Nanothreads provides a great variety of structures. Shown here are four different types of nanothreads. As you can see, obviously they all look different. That's because their connection patterns between the basic units are different. It's easy to discern the repeating unit, for example, in this thread but it's not that easy to look for the uh, repeating unit, for example, in this one. And that's because this structure is chiral and it has a very large unit cell. So yes, you can have chirality in the structure. You can also have different degrees of saturation in the thread, by which I mean, not all carbons has to be sp3. You, you can have sp2 carbons forming a double bond here and there. And also you can have a heteroatoms doping uh, in the backbone. You can think of replacing one of the CH bonds with a nitrogen atom. So you have a nitrogen atom in the, in the backbone. Last but not least, you can have a substitution for the CH bonds to bring in uh, functional groups, which adds to the uh, variety of the structures. The second thing I think nanothreads are interesting has to do with its mechanical properties. And it is this uh, magic combination of rigidity and flexibility of nanothreads. So to appreciate that, I'm comparing here uh, with nanotubes and traditional polymers. Nanotubes, as we know, they are strong, they are rigid, they can be flexible if they are long. And nanothreads, uh, compared with nanotubes, they are as strong as nanotubes according to calculations. They are also rigid, but they are more flexible because of the sp3 bonding in the backbone. Uh, the traditional, for traditional polymers, they are most flexible, but they lose rigidity. They are usually very weak. They are usually entangled, forming amorphous material. So one big difference I want to point out between nanothreads and traditional polymers is that 
uh, the, if you like the monomers of nano threads, the unit of nano threads are connected by multiple uh, covalent bonds, two or three, but for traditional polymers, the connection is usually one bond. So that's what gives nano thread rigidity. And the third thing I think it's a very uh, important one that I think nano threads are interesting is because uh, I think nano threads can serve as a platform for functionality. So we have uh, many CH bonds in nano threads. We can do substitution of this CH bond with functional groups. So we may be able to control uh, the alignment of these functional groups. Uh, we might be able to uh, control the spacing between them and uh, we might be able to put different functional groups next to each other to give you the uh, functionality you want. And this feature really gives nano threads the potentiality to <clears throat> be in, uh, to be applied in many applications. And we'll go back to this point later in the last section. <clears throat> And here I want to point out it is this rigidity of nano thread backbone that you can have this alignment or control spacing of the functional groups. If there's no rigidity, you don't, you cannot do this. So uh, the nat a natural question arises that is how can we control where we put the uh, functional groups on the thread? And that, that has to do with how we make nano threads. Um, which is what I'm going to talk about next. But the quick answer is that nano threads are made by polymerizing small molecules, for example, benzene. So there are two strategies you can introduce uh, functional groups. The first is to attach the functional groups to the molecule before polymerization. The second is to do post polymerization functionalization. So now let's move um, into uh, nano thread discovery. There is this first mention of a one-dimensional diamond crystal by Clark, by Arthur Clark, in his famous novel, The Fountains of Paradise, where he even, uh, envisioned a space elevator built from this strong and lightweight one-dimensional diamond crystal. He was right to uh, recognize the strength and the uh, uh, flexibility or the lightweightness of the, this material. But this, this is not a uh, real material at that time. The first real scientific work is from 2001. And there are three predictions for the um, nano thread structures before the actual first synthesis uh, from benzene. So I'll be talking about three predictions first. Uh, the three predictions comes from three different groups. It's very interesting to see how they came to the same idea from different uh, approaches or perspectives. The first prediction is from the Crespi group, where they, want, uh, they wanted to make a very narrow nanotube, no nano thread, a nanotube. So they took a very narrow strip of graphene and rolled it into a tube. This is what they get. And you can see from this picture that they, uh, because the thread, is, the tube is so thin and uh, the curvature on the surface is so large that the sp2 carbon, the planar um, tricoordination is so distorted. It looks like these carbons are already in sp3 state. It looks like as if there's a dangling bond here and dangling bond there. So they thought, why don't we just cap those dangling bonds with hydrogen atoms to stabilize the structure? And after doing that, this is what they get. It's a very beautiful structure, three, uh, thread three zero nano thread. And if you are an organic chemist, you can uh, discern the um, different conformations of the six membrane, for example, the chair foam and the boat foam on the side. The second, prediction is from the Hoffman group where they were uh, studying theoretically uh, the bending phase phi, which is a hypothetic phase under pressure. And they found that this uh, structure spontaneously collapsed into a uh, one dimensional um, polymer, which is a, they call polymer one. You can take a look at the structure here. So this work kind of hinted the nano thread synthesis from uh, benzene under pressure. 
the third prediction, prediction is from the Trauner group. Uh, this is very interesting because they are a synthetic organic group. They wanted to synthesize uh, the, uh, the one-dimensional thread polytwisting, and their approach is to start with this um, molecule called twisting, and by adding uh, two carbon bridges here, they were able to extend the structures to di, tri, tetra, and finally they hope to get to uh, polytwisting. And if I remember it correctly, I think they were able to make tri twisting. I might be wrong. This is a, a very beautiful uh, structure, as you can see here. Um, it's chiral, where you can see the uh, strand uh, going clockwise, looking uh, from the top. And it has a irrational pitch, meaning the structure never repeats itself along the thread axis. So on this slide, I'm putting all these three structures uh, together just to compare their differences. Um, it might not be realized that all the three structures can be viewed as a stack of bending or six membrane with different connection patterns between the rings. The red lines indicate the connection. You can see they are different. And polytwisting, they has very, this very interesting projection along the thread axis. It has this cylindrical shape because of its chiral and also because it has an irrational pitch. So the CH spinning, CH bound spinning around uh, all the angles uh, around the thread. Now moving to the synthesis, the actual synthesis of a nano thread was done through high pressure solid state polymerization. Here I'm showing you a schematic where we can put in bending molecules into this diamond amber cell. Uh, under compression and outcomes are the uh, ordered nano thread crystal. So a few words on them and the, and the cell. This is a specially designed apparatus to apply hundreds of gigapascals of pressure to the sample. So in order to achieve such high pressure, we, the sample size really has to be small. And usually sample uh, scale is, uh, sample size is on the scale of microgram. It's really tiny. Um, but in this case, we don't really need such high pressure. We only need 20, around 20 GPA. So when benzene is slowly compressed to 23 GPA and slowly brought back to ambient pressure, a white solid is recovered. And immediately from the color, you can tell that this uh, material is insulating. And this is actually, I would say, a very remarkable transformation because it is the first time in 100 years of history of people compressing benzene that an ordered product is formed, is recovered. The order can be seen from this picture, from this image, uh, optical image. If you look closely, you will see the thread bundles in this direction, showing you the, showing you the order. So I have uh, three more slides, um, more evidence for the order in the coming slides. But here I want to uh, point out the slow change in the pressure rate that's really important to this reaction. And the reason for that, I, uh, I think is this. So uh, this reaction, we think it's a kinetically controlled process, the polymerization. So there are many potential pathways from benzene to other uh, polymers. If we increase the pressure slowly, we are able to, maybe we are able to uh, follow only one or two pathways and that's gonna give us an ordered product. If you compress too fast, many pathways will be uh, uh, followed. So you will end up with a amorphous material. Um, some diffraction, uh, some uh, characterizations showing you the order. The first one is very important, uh, the diffraction. Um, the sample shows this very unique six-fold, uh, single crystal like six-fold diffraction spots or patterns, uh, not only from X-ray, but also from uh, electron diffraction. And this 
unique pattern can only match the simulated um, diffraction pattern for a packed nanothread crystal. Here we are using a polytwist stain as a nanothread model, but if we put in another uh, type of thread, that's okay, you will get similar displacing. Um, and we have tried a, um, a reasonable set of hydrocarbons that might have this sixfold. Uh, for example, um, graphene, graphene, and some other 3D CH network. None of this can give us a diffraction pattern that matches experiment. So we took this as a very strong evidence uh, for the formation of nano thread from bending. Uh, the displacing of 5.6 Armstrong translates to a center to center distance of 6.4 Armstrong, which includes not only the width of the thread, but also the vulnerable spacings between them. Okay. Uh, transmission electron microscopy image uh, you see here shows this striations for the sample. And if you follow this black line, you will see uh, uh, the peaks spaced at 6.4 Einstrom, which agrees with the X-ray diffraction, uh, also with the uh, simulation. So when you sonicate the sample in a solvent to break apart the thread, you will be able to see individual threads protruding out from the, the edge of this big sample. Um, optical image shows the thread bundles on the scale of 20 micron. And the, these thread bundles can be exfoliated into individual fibers that shows uh, birefringence. And this birefringence is consistent with nano thread structure and their packings being anisotropic. So I think the, uh, from the uh, three previous slides, the characterization established that uh, nano thread has been made under pressure, and in this case from benzene, and it's ordered. I mean, and it's not just benzene that gives uh, nano threads. Uh, over the years, we have found that uh, other types of small aromatic molecules, for example, fluorinated benzene, pyridine, furan, thiophene, they all form nano threads under pressure. The pressure can be a uh, different. Um, but uh, the important thing is that they all gives the, they all give this characteristic six-fold diffraction patterns that can only be matched by the simulated pattern for a um, nanothread crystal. And the spacings can be larger than benzene uh, in this case, similar to benzene uh, in this case, and smaller than benzene. The, this depends on the size of the ring and all uh, the numbers make sense. And here I want to point out that if we start with this hetero uh, um, with the rings with heteroatoms, we will end up with um, the heteroatoms will end up in the backbone of the form nanothread. That is kind of a neat way to uh, dope the nanothread, if you will, um, and it's a much better way uh, to dope nanothread if you compare. Uh, for example, doping nanotubes, which is very difficult. They cannot get many of the uh, heteroatoms in the uh, nanotube. So uh, that's uh, sort of a long introduction. Um, uh, I want to ask if there's any questions so far uh, before I move into the, uh, uh, my work. Let me just check if there's any question. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's continue. So I'm interested in structure and reaction mechanisms. First thing, um, oh, one question, are there just, any? Just yeah, yeah, there's a question. Yeah, I, I saw the question. Are there any natural examples of these materials? Um, I, I don't know what you mean by natural example. Do you mean um, natural occurring? These uh, materials has been made um, 
in in the lab. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question. So natural occurring, okay. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think so. Okay, another question. Can you comment on the electronic structure, especially band gap? Uh, I'll be talking about that uh, later, but not in much detail. So uh, one thing I can say here is that these structures are, um, if they are fully saturated, I mean, if all the carbons are sp3, they, they tend to be uh, insulated. But if you have some sp2 carbon remaining in the structure, and if these sp2 carbons are in a uh, particular orientation, you will have this pi pi overlap across the thread, then you might be able to get a, uh, a smaller band gap and a very big band, band width for the pi bond. And you can think about doping and how doping those double bonds and to do some band gap engineering. Uh, that's something uh, very interesting. I, I'm gonna mention that later, but uh, this is uh, all I'll, I will say about band gaps in this talk. Okay, and the question, what was TM technique? Um, so I'm not an expert on TM. Uh, I think in that TM image I showed you, uh, there are two actually two uh, TM. So the, the electron diffraction, I think they used, uh, they were, they did this on a, they call a Titan TM. I don't know what does that mean. They also use a very low dose um, um, irradiation just to uh, get a stronger signal. I think that's, uh, they have done a lot of uh, test uh, uh, trial and error. This is uh, the, the, the best image they could get. Yes, you will be able to see uh, if the sample is not oriented this way with the end on, you will not able to see the six fold. You will, if the sample is like lying flat, you will only be able to see two diffraction spots. And that sometimes they also see the two uh, spots in the, um, in the electron diffraction. I mean the image, not the diffraction, okay. Yeah, again, I'm not an expert on this. And so I really don't know how to answer your question. But if you're interested, I can certainly ask the question uh, um, to my collaborator and hopefully they can do answer this, do answer this question for you. Uh, if you can just send me an email after this talk, uh, uh, I'll be able to look into this. Okay. So I guess we, we need to move on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, first question, structures. Uh, what are, I've showed you many uh, nanothread structures. The question is, are there any other possibilities for the structures? How many more are there? Uh, to answer that question, we need to, we could start with a view of the structure, which is that the, the thread structures can be uh, constructed from a stack of benzene ring, and it's just a different connection pattern between them that give rise to different structures. So what we did is a uh, thorough examination of the different path, different um, connection types between the rings, and did a uh, enumeration uh, for the all uh, for all the nanothread structures. And in the process, we find this uh, concept of, of degree of saturation very uh, useful. So let me just uh, explain it. It just means the number of sp2 carbons in one CH6 ring. So for example, benzene, there's no sp3 carbon, so degree zero. In the uh, fully saturated, as uh, so our organic chemists will say, all carbons are sp3, so it's degree six. Uh, in the partially polymerized benzene ring, two sp3 carbons, so degree two, uh, this one is degree four. So with this degree of saturation, it immediately tells us there are two immediate stages between benzene and the fully saturated nanothread. So what I'm going to do next is that I will explain the enumeration for degree two, degree four, and degree six nanothreads. And I, I go through the slides very quickly, so you have to believe me that I we have done proper work and not missing any uh, missing any possibilities. 
So the strategies here is uh, uh, very similar across the three cases. So we first identify the possible building blocks and then we connect them into a thread. These are the uh, possible building blocks. This one particular, in particular, it's a diverticle, it's high energy, so we excluded it. And there's mirror images for the chiral uh, building block that uh, has to be included because it will give different structures. And then we connected them in, in certain sequence, we consider eight of them. We have to stop at some point, so we limited ourselves to three units per unit cell. Here are some uh, relaxed structures and you can see clearly the uh, degree two building blocks here. Uh, we have eight isomers corresponding to the eight sequences here. And there are also conformers that arises from the uh, rotation of all the single bonds. The rotation of single bonds is a common feature for degree two because all the units are connected by one bond. Moving on to degree four, we have nine building blocks in two classes, the three U, one D meaning means three bonds going up, one bond going down or two bonds going up, two bonds going down. And the mirror images of A, B, B, C, D are also included. We also have some constraints here, uh, topological unit cells more than two, and, and we don't consider full membrane because of it, their high energy. Uh, something new uh, in the degree four nano thread is this uh, scene anti-configuration. Uh, uh, there will be a, Double bond remaining in the structure, they can be on the same side or opposite side. This is gonna be important because only the double bonds on the same side can go on to react uh, to form um, degree six nano threads. And this anti will be a dead end towards further reaction. Uh, here are some relaxed degree four threads. Here you can really appreciate the variety of the structures. And we have some um, very uh, straight ones, some very uh, helical ones with very large unit cell. Uh, in total, we have 23, and only seven of them have this thin configuration that can go on to degree six nano threads. The enumeration of degree six nano threads was done by our collaborator. They, um, they use a similar approach. These are the building blocks. Um, two bounds up, four bounds down, three bounds up, three bounds down. Uh, they also devised this um, nomenclature, uh, which is a string of six digits that encodes the, the information of the connections. So they uh, were able to find 50 uh, nano thread, degree six nano thread, and shown here are the 15 lowest energy ones. Uh, remember that the we talk about the three predicted nano thread structures. They all come out in this numeration, which is very nice. And the, this is an, uh, this is a polytwist and the helical one turns out to be the lowest energy thread um, among the degree six uh, threads. So now that we have degree two, degree four, degree six thread, you'd be interesting to compare their energies on the same graph. Um, graphene, uh, which has the same CH stoichiometry, turns out to be the lowest energy structure for the CH species. Degree six nano threads higher, but not by too much. And bending is here. Uh, degree two is here in this small, in this narrow range. And this is a four plus two dimer, so it's not polymer. And this is gonna be important in the initiation process. Its energy is higher. Degree four is here. So if we focus on the carrier blocks, we can see a clear trend of decreasing energy with increasing degree of saturation. That makes sense because if you go this way, you are converting the relatively weak double bonds, sp two carbons into a stronger sigma bond and then the, uh, the energy will be, uh, become lower, the system become more stabilized. But if you follow the trend backwards, you would expect that the benzene as a degree zero would be somewhere here, but actually it's much lower at here. And that's because benzene is aromatic, it has this uh, additional stabilization in it. 
And this leads to a intrinsic barrier for the transformation from benzene to degree six nanothread. And that's why pressure is needed to overcome this barrier. Another thing I want to point out in this slide is that uh, once the degree four or degree six nanothreads are formed, it's unlikely to revert back to benzene because of this barrier. So uh, once we have all the st uh, thread structures, we are ready to talk about the uh, reaction pathway. What we did is we examined the relationships between the threads. And once we have done that, we are left with this very complex roadmap. Let me just explain it to you. So here we have degree zero benzene. It can go on to four uh, degree two threads, which can then go on to seven degree, uh, sorry, degree two, and then degree four thread, and then I can go on to degree six thread. So each arrow here represents a uh, topological re relationship between the two structures or a potential reaction pathway between the, the two structures. So we are borrow, uh, we borrowing, we borrowed the uh, notation for the cyclo addition here just to indicate their uh, topological relationships. So usually if you follow a narrow, you increase the degree of saturation by two. So two to four, four to six, but there's one particular to reduce order cyclo addition uh, pathway. I'll talk about uh, uh, later. Um, uh, one thing I want to say here is that this is just a topological relationship between the uh, structures. There's no implication on which pathway is favorable, but we do want to know which pathway is favorable from a, a mechanistic point of view. So in order to, that, to do that, we need to calculate the barriers for the transformations. There seems to be a huge effort if you want to calculate all the barriers for all the pathways. So we are asking ourselves, is there any way we can exclude the pathways that are unplausible? The, this is where the uh, solid state structures of benzene come to help. So remember that the reaction occurred in a benzene crystal. So the, that means the crystal structure, the pathway has to be compatible with the orientations of the molecules in the crystal structure. Uh, we, uh, here we are looking at bending two, which is a phase uh, where the uh, uh, polymerization occurred. Uh, along the A and the B axis, we can see these bending stacks. Uh, the bending rings are parallel in each other, with each other, but their planes are not perpendicular to the axis. And there's another hidden stack along the AC direction, which you can also see here. It's this stack from this one to that one to that one. So the molecules are in sort of an edge to face fashion in this stack that we call this uh, stack the T stack. Uh, and by the way, we have a printed uh, 3D model for the bending crystal and it was a fun experience. And there's a lot of thinking going into how uh, to connect these individual bending molecules so that the whole model can be printed out as, a, as one piece. So back to the stacks, the, T, uh, the parallel stack seems to be compatible with a uh, Dio's order four plus two polymerization where each ring forms two bonds with the upper ring and two bonds with the lower ring uh, leading to this four plus two polymer uh, with, one, uh, with one remaining bond on the same side of a thread. So you can do further reaction uh, for the uh, remaining double bonds and, dip, uh, and depending on how you zip up, sort of uh, zip up the double bond, you can get different types of threads. Importantly, polytwisting can come out from this mechanism. Uh, the T stack on the other hand, seems to um, be compatible with what we call a para polymerization, where each molecule forms one bond up, one bond down, uh, giving us this uh, degree two polymer, which we call a para polymer. And in this polymer, we have two double bonds remaining in each ring. And if you polymerize the remaining double bonds uh, with different um, ways, we will end up with different types of threads. Uh, the thread three zero and polymer one can come from this mechanism. 
Now uh, we have those two plotable reaction mechanisms from the solid stru state structures of benzene. Uh, we want to calculate their barriers and to see which one is more favorable. And in order to do that, um, we need to calculate barrier, especially under high pressure. And that means we need to apply pressure to a single molecule. So how are we able to do that? Um, we looked around, there aren't many uh, methods available, but we found this one particularly useful. This is the so-called XPPCM method uh, from uh, Roberto Cami at uh, University of Parma, Italy. So I'm um, in close collaboration with him uh, on this method. Uh, this method is just a extension of the more traditional PCM polarized continent model. So just, uh, I'll walk through this model very quickly just to introduce the basic idea of how we introduce, uh, how we apply pressure to a molecule. So first of all, we have a molecule and we put it in a medium which has a dielectric constant and electron density. And there's a volume uh, for the molecule, a cavity for the molecule. And you can imagine that the electron density of the molecule, some of it will be inside of this cavity, some of it will be outside of this cavity. So for those outside of this cavity, we introduce a poly repulsion between those electron density with the electron density of the media. So that's, at this point, we're still at the uh, traditional PCM model. So if you want to increase the pressure, what we do is that we shrink the volume of the, for the molecule. And the, the result of that is more of the, <coughs> sorry, more of the uh, molecules electron will be outside of this cavity. And that means more of the electron, uh, more electron of the molecule will be uh, experiencing um, poly repulsion with the medium. And at the same time, we increase the uh, uh, electron density of the medium. And that leads to a, a even stronger uh, poly repulsion with the molecule. So an increase in the poly repulsion, uh, in my view, it is uh, sort of like the, um, microscopic response of increase in pressure. So in the actual calculation, we need to calculate the energy of the system at different volumes. Then we'll plot the energy versus volume and the pressure comes out as a negative of the slope of that curve. I hope this makes sense. Um, so with this matter, we are able to calculate the uh, reaction barriers, uh, reaction pathways for the four plus two cycle addition and the uh, radical um, pathway. Uh, here we are looking at the four plus two cycle addition, starting from benzene, going through a transition state to a dimer, then another transition state, trimer, and so on. Uh, we can, as we can see that pressure really stabilizes the uh, the, uh, the, the, this pathway, um, the energy, the reaction at 20 GPA becomes exothermic. And the overall barrier is reasonable, 19.6 gigapomol. It's reasonable for a uh, room temperature uh, reaction. On the other hand, for the radical mechanism, uh, even at 20 GPA, the uh, reaction is still uh, endothermic. And that means the reaction is not favorable uh, under pressure. So the conclusion here is that four plus two cycle addition is more favorable at high pressure. And it's most likely the reaction um, mechanism responsible for the nano thread formation. Uh, here I wanna explain a little bit why four plus two is favorable than the radical mechanism. Um, so four plus two forms two bonds at once and that means their transition state is more compact, has a smaller volume, and uh, the product will have a higher density. So that's why it's uh, more favored at high pressure. Uh, of course, this doesn't answer the, 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 all the question regarding mechanism. Uh, for example, where does this initiation occur? How does the uh, propagation um, um, proceed 
either a reaction front, things like that. Uh, we are still working on those. So a quick summary before I'm moving into the opportunities for uh, nano thread research. We've talked about nano thread predictions, synthesis structures and formation pathways, also barrier calculations. And if there's one thing I'd like to you to remember after this talk is that nano thread is an emerging field. There's lots of opportunities. Um, on this slide, uh, I'm listing some of the ideas. Um, I think uh, you might be interested if you want to uh, do some nano thread related research. And the lists uh, by no means are exhaustive. And um, some ideas follow uh, in, for example, in the chemistry can also be inter uh, interested to physicists or material scientists. So on the chemistry side, I've talked about structures, mechanism, and there's also precursor design and the functionalization. Uh, and that's gonna be important in, bring, in, in bringing the uh, functional groups to the thread. Uh, on the physics side, uh, there's uh, this uh, very interesting band structure for degree four polymers if the double bonds are on top of each other. And then, as I said, you can think about uh, band gap engineering and doping. And, and some threads are, are the band gap are in the semiconductor range. Also, the transport properties can be of interest. Uh, and this center, it's originally hosted in a di in diamond. And since nano threads are sort of like one dimensional diamond, so are we able to host an MV center in nano thread? And what are the, what are the advantages, differences um, um, in, for an MV center in nano thread compared with in diamond? These are the questions I'm very interested in. And on the materials side, uh, there are all sorts of properties you can measure or you can calculate mechanical, the thermal uh, and uh, the electric properties. Uh, and finally, I want to um, sort of emphasize again this idea of nano thread being platform for functionality. So if we are able to control the alignment, the spacing of the functional groups, we might be able to do a catalyst cascade where the uh, reaction is uh, goes to the first catalyst and then second and the third. If we ha can attach some bio functional um, molecules to the thread, we might have some bio applications. Um, and in single fission, the spacing between the chromophores are very important. So if we can control that with uh, nano threads, that's going to be a uh, very important in, in the single fission um, application. And there is much more you can think about. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank the nano thread team, this team that's uh, where it comes out uh, originally from the Energy uh, Department of Energy in the US, the E3 Center. John Badding uh, was the leading role in the uh, synthesis. And this center is now, we now have a dedicated center for the, uh, for the work is supported by National Science Foundation. There's a website if you are interested um, I encourage you to check it, check out the website. Here are the current PIs of the center and the postdocs, graduate students. I just left the center recently, but I still uh, remain in uh, close collaboration with them. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. So okay, there's- yeah, thank you very much both for this uh, fantastic talk. So there's already one question. Yeah, I'm looking at it. So there's a question about, um, can I say a little bit more about the potential as thermoelectrics? Um, it's going to be difficult for me because I'm not expert in these areas. Um, thermoelectric. Um, um, I can look for, I think there are, people have done some calculation on the thermoelectric properties for the material. I can look for the uh, references for you if you send me an email afterwards. That's okay. So 
Okay, any other question? Please remember that you can also, yeah, raise your hand. So, uh, sorry, let me, yeah. So, uh, Fernando Ecosillo, please. Hi, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, thank you very much, Bo, for your very nice uh, presentation. Very uh, inspiring. Thank um, you. I, I would like to, uh, I, I have a question about the, you have mentioned the, the possibility or the uh, functionalization of these uh, nano threads. Um, well, I would like to know, uh, in your opinion, um, what the, the best strategy is to introduce this functionalization. Should we deal with the monomers and functionalize the monomers and then to polymerize them to obtain the corresponding functionalized uh, nano threads? Or perhaps it's better first to polymerize and then, for instance, by using radical chemistry to introduce the other functional groups on the structure of the nano thread? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Um, so there are two strategies, as, say, as you said, to bring in the functional groups. Um, in my opinion, uh, I think it depends on uh, the structure of the thread. But in my opinion, I think it's better to bring in the functional groups before the polymerization and to use some um, super molecular chemistry to sort of organize the monomers. Uh, just to, in the beginning, we place the uh, functional groups at where they should be and do the polymerization. We recently have a work we are using the uh, per, uh, perfluorinated benzene and the benzene, sort of the, uh, this uh, quadruple, quadruple interaction as a uh, super molecular um, a super uh, chemistry uh, synthon to organize these structures. And, and also you can do uh, post polymerization functionalization. You, if you start, let's say with a chlorinated benzene, somehow, and you are able to get a thread with a CCL bond in the end, then you can do some CCL bond chemistry to functionalize the thread. I understand it's difficult to do the CH functionalization, but if you have some other groups, you, it might be easier to do. I okay, hope thank that, you. Uh, answers the question. Thank so, you very much. Giorgio Benedek also has a question. Giorgio, you have your microphone muted. Okay, you hear me? Now, <laughs> now yeah. yes. The um, yes. question is, um, when you have, um, for example, this hexagonal, this uh, poly uh, twice thing, and, and you apply the pressure, what prevents to have, for example, a, a, a di, uh, hydrogenation? dehydrogenation so as to form for example carbon foams uh, purely sp2 carbon foams or purely sp3 uh, class rates yeah mm -hmm. I, I, get, I get the question so you are uh, thinking about the um, sort of like a phase segre segregation so ch bond breaking right and um, i would say that because this is a pressure this is the pressure is um, is a high pressure reaction and the CH bond breaking, it sort of goes against the, uh, the compression. So that usually won't occur unless you, the pressure is really, really high. And that forming, for example, diamond is really uh, beneficial in terms of the uh, density, the small volume. Uh, at 20 GPA, I think that, uh, you know, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Bo. I think we, we lost the connection for, for your last uh, two sentences, I think. Sorry. Yes. Could you repeat that, please? So I, I was saying the the uh, the breaking of switch bound will not be a problem at 20 GPI. Maybe it will be a problem at even higher, let's say, a, a few hundreds of GPA. Uh, and I think there's uh, calculations of hydrocarbons under um, probably terapascal uh, pressure, where they do see um, breaking a part of CC bond and a rearrangement of the molecules and forming um, 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 some other uh, 
and not normal structures. Um, I have a reference if you are interested, I can send it back to you. Just send me a privately, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a, a comment on um, uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, Alex mentioned carbine. Yes, carbine is a uh, one dimensional polymer, but it's uh, sort of like SP carbon, or if you like SP carbon. So in my chart, I didn't, um, I didn't list SP three in this chart. Just so SP two and SP three. Um, problem: carbine can only be isolated as solid. Um, advantage, electronic properties must be very interesting for semiconductor physicists. Yeah, carbon, there's, uh, as far as I know, there's some uh, studies on carbine and there's um, actual synthesis of carbine, but they need to have a, a cap, the two caps at the end. You can have a, like a 10 carbons or 20 carbons chain and you have to have a cap there. And sometimes they protect the chain with a, uh, a sort of like a belt or ring molecules around the, the, the chain. I remember some of that work. So is, is there uh, any other question, any comment left? Okay. So if not, I think we can uh, finish the, the talk uh, here. So I think it was an, a splendid way to start the series of online seminars of the IPC. Thank you very much, Bo. Yeah, this, thank you. Uh, thank you for attending the seminar. Yeah, this fantastic talk. I hope that uh, some people have uh, been motivated to start some research on nano threads uh, following your, your talk. And I'm really glad to see uh, all of you attending the, the seminar. I hope that, uh, let's say, you spent uh, as nicely as possible these uh, last weeks. And, well, I think we, we will see each other uh, at least in this uh, format that uh, I think we will continue with that and we will uh, be enjoying as much as we have enjoyed uh, today with you, Bob. So thank you very much, everyone. And yeah, thank you. you. Thanks,